Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this panel on election administration and, and the triumphs and tribulations of it in the 2022 election. Uh, we are going to get started. I'm excited to hear from all of our panelists about what worked, what might not have, and, and what we need to learn going into the next election. So let me introduce our panelists. I'm very happy to be up here with all of them. Uh, first to my right is Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse-Oliver from New Mexico. Um, she has worked in election administration for over 15 years um, and is New Mexico's 26th Secretary of State. Secretary Toulouse-Oliver has been involved in politics and public policy for over two decades. And her work is focused on increasing voter access, running efficient, secure, and fair elections, and bringing more transparency and increased ethical standards to government. And then next to her, to her right, is Seth Bluestein. Seth has worked for the Philadelphia Board of Elections for more than 10 years, and he's currently serving as city commissioner. And prior to his appointment as commissioner, he was the chief deputy commissioner for Al Schmidt. Welcome, Seth. And then to Seth's right is Ben Hovland. Ben Hovland was unanimously confirmed by the US Senate in January 2019 to serve as a commissioner with the US Election Assistance Commission. He, is, he was serving as chairman of the EAC during 2020 and previously was acting chief counsel of the US Senate Committee on Rules and Administration and also has been deputy general counsel for the Missouri Secretary of State. So welcome. Thank you, good to be here. And, and to his right is Natalie Adona, who is the clerk recorder-elect for Nevada County, California. She will take office on January 3rd, 2023, and please mark your calendars because that is her birthday. Ah. <laughs> so welcome, Natalie. Thanks for making the trip to be here. Thank you. And so I'm gonna kick this off with Ben uh, and just ask him kind of a, a general question, which is, hey, how did this election go overall? Um, there were obviously some things in the voting process that went well, some things that went less well. What, what can we take out of this election into 2024? Yeah, thanks for that, Carrie. Uh, it's, you know, I, I mean, I think we've already heard from the earlier panels, but, but looking out across the country, you know, I think as we were coming into uh, this year or going really, really post 2020, uh, and with all the disinformation uh, through 2021 and the conspiracy theories, uh, you know, I think as, as people said earlier, you really didn't know what to expect going into uh, 2022 uh, and throughout this election season. And I think in this moment, you know, when you look out at elections and election administration, uh, it's harder than it's ever been to run elections and it's more expensive than it's ever been to run elections. There are just so many challenges. Uh, and despite that, uh, I think election officials around the country, state and local election officials, did an amazing job. Uh, you know, we heard, we heard a few uh, issues brought up earlier, a couple snafus here and there. Uh, that's what happens. There are so many people involved in elections. You know, that's, that's the nature of it. Uh, but by and large, uh, you know, state and local election officials did an amazing job taking on uh, you know, all these challenges, the regular historic challenges of running elections, uh, plus cybersecurity, plus mis and disinformation, plus threats and harassment, plus the weaponization of information requests and just the volume of dealing uh, with all of that. Uh, and in particular, uh, I would like to, you know, give a shout out to the new election officials. Uh, you know, we, we've seen a lot of turnover in the space. Uh, some new folks came in, others stepped up into new roles and again, did an amazing job. Uh, and so really, you know, to me, that is, that is certainly a part of the story of 2022. Um, but uh, as, as has been mentioned a little bit earlier as well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember, uh, you know, patting ourselves on the back after 2018. Uh, midterms are not presidential years. And so I do think it's important, you know, that we continue that focus uh, you know, yes, you know, 2022 was a very well-administered election, but so was 2020. Uh, I've said before, 2020 was the best administered election I've seen in my career, uh, you know, bar none. Uh, but that didn't stop uh, the mis- and disinformation, and so I think we have to continue to keep that focus, uh, you know, and continue to press forward uh, to ensure, uh, you know, that there's still work to be done, uh, and, and that is, 
you know, that is hard. We, there are no reprieves anymore in elections, uh, sadly. Uh, but, uh, you know, so on to 24. <laughs> All right, that leads to my next question. Seth, you know, this year, once again, all eyes were on Pennsylvania, um, and it seems likely that may continue. And most notably, you had a gubernatorial candidate who had promoted baseless conspiracy theories about elections, had boosted that. Uh, and so there was a lot of attention on that race. And that candidate, Doug Mastriano, did not win. But what do we take from that, right? What's the state of play for that now? What does that tell us, or not? Yeah. Well, first, I'd just like to thank everyone in this room and watching from home for how great of a job they did running the elections this year. And they were so successful across the country because of the work that you did. And in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia in particular, we were really grateful to know the results on election night and not keep everyone waiting until the following weekend to know who the winners were. So, you know, we felt very lucky in that regard. And in Pennsylvania, as you said, there was a gubernatorial candidate running for office. In Pennsylvania, the governor appoints the secretary of state who runs elections for the Commonwealth. And that individual was one of the lead election deniers coming out of 2020. And what we saw in Pennsylvania and across the country were individuals who denied the results of the election, but by and large, they lost their races. And I think everyone took a collective deep breath and patted themselves on the back and thought, ah, we just had a really successful election. It's a week later. Everyone lost who was a potential threat at the governor level or secretary of state level for running elections in 2024. But what we saw in Pennsylvania and in other locations is not just at the state level where there might be threats, and the earlier panel mentioned this, but there are still challenges at the county level. And what we saw was in Arizona and in Pennsylvania and in other states across the country, county officials considering not certifying the election or voting to not certify the election until ordered to do so by a court. And that is where I think we need to keep an eye on coming out of this election, even though it was extremely well run, and as Ben said, 2020 was also really well run. But we have this threat still where at the county level, we need to keep an eye on who the commissioners are and how they're paying attention to election denial, uh, misinformation, and whether or not we're gonna have that problem occur in 2024 when, once again, at the highest levels of the presidential race, there's the potential of election denial and mis and disinformation. I'm glad you touched on the certification issue because that, that was my next question, actually. We at VoteBeat have intensively covered the certification um, hurdles that came up in Arizona. And so I know that Secretary Tillis Oliver, you have dealt with that in New Mexico, in Otero County, I believe. And so obviously, I, you know, you have some experience with this. I'm hoping you can talk about this um, since it seems to be now surfacing around the country uh, about the lessons of that. Yeah, what a, wild, uh, what a wild year in many ways and what a very calm and uh, amazing year in many ways. And as uh, Carrie mentioned, <coughs> Uh, I've been in election administration now for almost 16 years. I was a county clerk of the largest jurisdiction in New Mexico for 10 years before I became Secretary of State. So this is the eighth general election that I've either run on the ground or overseen at the state level. And as everyone who's in election administration knows, every election's different. The challenges that arise are different. How we have to deal with them are different. We learn everything. Uh, or we learn something from every election and we're able to plan and prepare for the next election, but inevitably the challenges that we see in that next election don't look exactly like what the challenges were before. And so this year, one thing that we tend to, to believe as election administrators is that primaries are relatively chill, uh, that you know, they're, they're often a dry run for you know, trying out new policies, new procedures, seeing how they work with a smaller turnout population. In my state, not only did we have to run a primary through the largest wildfire in state history, which impacted tens of thousands of voters in the northern part of my state, that was extremely challenging. We thought that was the biggest challenge of the primary. <laughs> what turned out to be the biggest challenge was that we saw for the first time in my state, and I think it sort of kicked off the 2022 version of 
counties that are not going to certify elections based on gut feelings. That was a literal quote uh, by one of the county commissioners in Otero County, New Mexico, who incidentally is no longer a county commissioner. He was removed from office because he engaged in sedition in participating in the January 6th uh, horror. Uh, and so that was all very positive, but before he was removed from office, he was ginning up his entire commission to say, look, we can't trust these voting machines, um, despite a very competent, uh, experienced Republican county clerk for that county. They were getting ready and, in fact, took an initial vote to flush 7,800 voters' votes down the toilet uh, after the primary election. And the, the biggest irony to me of that is that one of the commissioners himself was on that primary ballot. Had they not certified the election, uh, would not have ended up on the general ballot uh, and would not have been reelected. Um, and, and so I think you know part of the struggle we're having, of course, we, we, we went, my office went straight to the Supreme Court, said, tell them they have to do their job. This is a ministerial duty. This is not optional. This is not a choice you make based on gut feelings. This is quite honestly a rubber stamp to say, yes, this election happened. The county clerk and their team did the job. Um, but I think it, it highlights the challenge. Of course, we've seen other counties and other states um, try that a, a little bit in 2020, and now we're seeing it happen. You know, we're, we went through this challenge again recently in other states after the general. So I think this is a blueprint uh, for what we may potentially see in 2024 to um, dovetail off what Seth and uh, Ben were saying, that <clears throat> even though this year went pretty well, very well, uh, we, we can foresee these challenges moving forward. And, and so I think that brings us to Natalie, who, who might be in the best position of everyone here, to talk about how um, to deal with these election conspiracy theories and, and this bad information at the local level, how it's filtered down to the local level, what to expect from that, and, and what strategies you have for that. Since that I, I'm a little surprised right. to learn that I am the best resource uh, for that. I was hoping to get some ideas from all of you. <laughs> um, thank you. And, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge, you know, that how lucky I feel to be invited here. And that, I mean, this is sort of a retrospective of what happened in 2022. Uh, but we have an election going on today in uh, the state of Georgia. And, you know, big shout out to them. Um, so in, in my office, um, you wouldn't think that there would be huge problems with conspiracy theories in California if you did not know any better, uh, but uh, there has been a, a, a rise in uh, extreme political rhetoric uh, and in um, extreme political thoughts around elections uh, in uh, some of the redder parts of the state. I do try to work with everyone who approaches our office. Um, some people are intensely curious about the way elections work because they have been fed this diet of mis and disinformation about the way elections work. And you know, they really and truly just want to learn, hey, how does all of this, I mean, how do you verify signatures? How do you know that, you know, this is the person who they say they are? Uh, how do you actually go about extracting the ballots, setting up in-person voting? And for those, I would say, 70, 80 percent of people who are skeptical, who want to learn more, we actually do end up turning them around and making them feel a little bit better uh, about how elections work in our county. But there are some people that you can never convince. And you know, I, I have noticed over the time that I have been in Nevada County that the tactics are getting more sophisticated. Um, the, the tactics are, are changing because they learned through my own election that if I don't get help from state and local law enforcement or local election officials that I'll just go straight to the media. Uh, and um, it is sometimes really uncomfortable to be confronted by the media. Uh, I know that from my job, and they have learned that through me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think by and large, you know, there is still a lot of distrust in elections and the people who run them. 
I do try to be responsive to things like records requests, and you know, it remains an ongoing challenge, and I expect it to intensify in 2024, but I think it's going to be quite different from what we saw in this midterm from 2020 and um, you know, from every election in between. I have to just follow up on something you said, and I'm, I'm hoping you can all speak to it, but what are these sort of new tactics that you see emerging that you mentioned, the more sophisticated ones? I'd love it if you could all speak to that. Am I, am I starting? Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think the um, sort of intensity of the public records request has you know, sort of risen dramatically. Um, you know, from this election, there was a coordinated effort to monitor what it was that we were doing. I got a um, bunch of text messages on election night in November of my workers asking me, did you know that there is somebody filming us closing the drop boxes? Did you know that there's someone filming us doing X, Y, and Z? Uh, of our jobs, and I got the, the text messages all at once, um, which had not happened before. And um, to me, it, it said a couple of things that, you know, one, if, if people are being quiet and not coming in to observe, they may be planning to, to do something else. Um, and, you, you know, I think uh, on the one hand, if you want to, you know, film any part of the process, it is a public area, I cannot prevent people from filming stuff that is occurring publicly. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, I can't prepare my workers for it. So, you know, some of them thought that I was monitoring them. Like, no, I did not know uh, anything uh, about this. And it just, you know, sort of raised the level of their nervousness about, you know, messing up or, you know, that maybe they were going to be, you know, sort of posted all over the internet, uh, something like that. So. You know, I, I worry a little bit about them coming back to work. We'll see. I hope they do, because they're all really good. Thank you, Natalie. Sure. Ben? Uh, one thing that I'd say that is, you know, feels unique about the current circumstances uh, around a lot of the, the mis and disinformation around a lot of the organizing it is, one, the, the scale and the breadth of it. Uh, you know, uh, talking to officials all over the country, uh, it is it is all over the country. You know, it isn't it isn't necessarily everywhere, but the breadth of it is unbelievable. And um, and you know that shows uh, a level of coordination. Uh, you know, whether that's uh, just or connections through the internet, uh, certainly some coordination. Uh, but I think uh, what what has changed that. I mean, part of that. Um, you know, we heard some some conversation on one of the earlier panels about, uh, you know, election administration uh, not being about politics. Uh, but, but we are politics adjacent, and, and certainly, uh, you know, when I was at the Missouri Secretary of the State's office, Missouri used to be a swing state. Uh, it isn't anymore, uh, you know, but uh, Ohio isn't really a swing state anymore. And being a swing state brings a level of attention. Uh, you know, the people who are election administrators in Florida are now looking at the folks in Arizona thinking, wow, that used to be us, and, and now it isn't. Um, but this isn't just that. Uh, you know, and I think, I think part of that is, is the fact that we have people profiteering off of trying to tear down our democracy, and that's where the breadth comes in. Uh, because you know, if you're raising money, if you're trying to get money, you want a scattershot across the whole country. So, so you know, the bluest blue counties, the reddest red counties, you're seeing it in these places uh, because it's an opportunity for something different. It's not about the election. Uh, it's not just about politics, it's about something else. And that is, that is, that is different. Um, and again, I think the volume of it all, the volume of the record requests has consequences, uh, particularly because, you know, it's not new that elections are under-resourced. Uh, but you have these finite resources of time and money. Um, and, and actually, uh, you sent around um, a, a vote beat newsletter uh, that talked about how in, uh, recently how in elections, uh, you know, there are no uh, human mistakes or, or, there, or there is no... Uh, just, About me, I did do that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, you know, essentially that, you know, there aren't innocent mistakes or nobody believes them, uh, you know, and I think 
But when you look at those resource challenges around time, uh, you know, again, running elections is extremely labor intensive. And so when you would have triple checked something and now you can only double check it because you're, you're responding to weaponized records requests, uh, you know, mistakes happen. Uh, you know, that is real. And unless we, uh, you know, adequately fund uh, elections for the moment that we're in, uh, I think we'll continue to see that and see more of it. Uh, and, and that is very concerning to me. And Seth, what tactics and strategies are you seeing in, in your part of the world? Yeah, well, I think the key word you, you both said is coordination. And that's really what it comes down to. Let me give you an example from Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania, there's a unique part of the statute that allows for individuals in a precinct to request a hand recount of that precinct. It requires a bond, it requires three voters from that precinct to sign a petition, they have to go to court, and they can do that. And in 2016, Philadelphia was the recipient of some of those petitions from the Jill Stein campaign because she had misinformation and didn't believe that the voting machines weren't hacked by Russia. So she requested in 2016, uh, recounts by hand of certain precincts. Now, that was one candidate who lost doing that in one county. This year, we saw across dozens of counties, nearly 100 of these petitions being filed in a coordinated way where there were no allegations of fraud or anything that was wrong with the election, but they wanted to, again, on a gut feeling, uh, have it be audited and recounted by hand in those precincts. So what you're seeing is taking normal parts of the law, whether it's open records requests or, requ or petitions for recounts, and then they're being coordinated in a way to abuse the system to make it harder for election administrators to do their jobs, and then also to delay elections being certified. And, you know, I don't want this panel to be too down uh, on where things are with the election administration because everyone did such a great job in actually managing the election, but it's important to just take the positives of how the election was run and start thinking through where those gaps are and where those guardrails held this time, but they're being attacked and possibly won't hold next time. And what you see from this election is you know, testing of those procedures to see how they can be used two years from now. And Secretary Toulouse Oliver, can you speak to this? Yeah, I, I will echo everything everyone has said and, and kind of tie it up in a, a big ugly bow of, uh, we, we are throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. You know, known, you know, issues, uh, and when I say known, I mean issues that have been widely circulated. So, oh, you know, the, the voting machines can be hacked and they're sending, you know, election results to Venezuela, right? So, so those, um, you know, those lies are being used to generate, you know, questions around the validity of uh, the counting machines and to, to force, you know, we've seen in a lot of different uh, localities, you know, this, this effort to try to force hand counts and, you know, when you don't think about what the politics of that are, you know, you go, okay, well, yeah, sure, hand counts. Well, those of us that have been in election administration for a long time know two things about hand counts. Number one, they're extremely time intensive. So it's gonna force an incredible amount of delay. The longer you delay officializing election results, the more questions that can be raised, the more court challenges potentially, right? So you're creating room for more opportunity for uh, trying to tamper with the election process when you try to force a hand count. And number two, hand counts are just not accurate. I mean, humans are just not as good as we think we are. Uh, and, and it takes a long, long, long time to get it right. And that is why we use computers to count uh, votes and then go back and mo most places in my state was one of the first to verify those results, right? To have that faith in the accuracy. Um, but it, it's not just that, it's, you know, I saw an email that was circulated around my state after the election, a eight page uh, screed about all the different reasons why the election in New Mexico wasn't valid, um, none, none of which were true. But, you know, they're even raising the issue of, well, you know, Maggie Toulouse Oliver was on the ballot and therefore she could not, um, 
you know, be ethically uh, charged with running the election. Well, <clears throat> we can have that discussion about whether people who run for office can also run elections. Incidentally, of those eight general elections I referenced, I've been on the ballot for all but two of them. Uh, and that issue has not been raised before uh, because our system is set up to prevent any one person, right? And this is true in every state from being able to affect the outcome of an election. But the point being that they are just throwing everything at the wall uh, that they can possibly throw to see you know, where there might be an opportunity. Uh, again, just to echo everything that my colleagues have said, to look for where is maybe a path forward to try and uh, tamper with or negatively impact the election administration process in, in future elections. Well, before we take questions from you all and, and from, I think, social media, I, I don't want to leave it all on a downer note, as, as Seth said, or wrapped in a big ugly bow. Um, <laughs> it's the holiday. Uh, are there reasons that you all have to be optimistic? What's, what's looking up? And uh, I guess let's go back to Ben. He's had a little break here. Well, you know, I, I mean, I think what, you know, what really gives me optimism, I mean, really the the best thing about my job is talking to state and local election officials, uh, you know, seeing them at their offices around the country, the amazing work they do. And, you know, again, time after time, uh, election officials, you know, keep bailing us out. They do more with less. Uh, but the reality is, uh, you know, I'll try to keep this upbeat, but, but that is not fair. You know, we have got to do more. We've got to give them uh, the resources they need. Uh, and that's, that's, federal resources, that's state resources, and that's local resources. You know, they're, uh, you know, everybody's on the ballot. You know, we've got local races, we've got state races, we've got federal races. Uh, you know, there are states that have chargebacks. Uh, you know, people can, can pay their portion of the ballot. In, and in the conversation earlier, uh, you know, there were, there were the examples that, uh, you know, this is a national security issue now. There are federal mandates, for example. And, um, you know, and, and I guess I look at it right now, um, you know, Congress is looking to see if they can fund the government. And in there uh, is $400 million, potentially, of HAVA security money. Uh, you know, this moment right now is probably, in the next couple weeks, we will see whether or not uh, the federal government makes an investment for the 2024 election. Because that window is right now. It is these two weeks. Procurement takes time. Uh, and, and, you know, running elections, as I said earlier, uh, is more expensive than it's ever been. Uh, election officials do an amazing job. Again, that it gives me a lot of confidence, uh, but I'm tired of seeing them have to do it alone. And so uh, I think we need to see a lot more support of them. This is one of the only times I've asked somebody what gives you reason to be optimistic and heard this is a national security issue. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. I like it. Seth? Uh, what gives me optimism is that people like Natalie and Maggie, despite going through past election cycles, ran again and are staying on board to be an election official going forward. And they're not alone. And despite the challenges of losing election officials, and you know, a quarter of the election officials are leaving in Pennsylvania, over a third of the election administrators have left. But for those who remain, they're doing so knowing the challenges and having their experience and their commitment to running elections the right way gives me optimism and hope for the future. Maggie? I don't know if that's reason for optimism. We may wonder about our mental health. Um, no, I'm, I, I'm kidding. But I, I agree with that. I, I also think the field of election administration uh, over time has just become incredibly more professional, incredibly more diverse. You know, it used to be, you know, uh, whoever sort of the, the local political favorite was got the job of being the election administrator in a jurisdiction. And now I think folks are understanding, you know, we need people. The reality is in these jobs, we have to be election experts. We have to be election law experts. We have to be cybersecurity experts. We have to be IT experts. We have to be communications experts, right? So it calls for a lot of skills and abilities, uh, and I think the electorate understands that it's important to have professionals in these jobs. And, and then on that note, um, I'll also add, I think in, we, we started doing this, I think, pretty darn well in 2020, foreseeing the post-election challenges. We didn't know exactly what they were gonna be, but we did a good job as a community of, of pre-bunking, if you will, 
some of the things we could see coming down the pipeline of, you know, we're not gonna know on election night, you know, because we have all of these critical states that are still gonna have ballots to count and this is how the process works. I think we did an even better job of that and that isn't just the work of election administrators, it's also the work of the media, which has really invested incredible amounts of time and effort working with offices like mine and local election offices to get information, okay, how does this actually work because the media wants to be good partners and helping us pre-bunk or debunk some of the election myths that are out there. As a result, I think the electorate, whether they want to be or not, <laughs> is much more informed about how the election process works and I think that significantly contributed to the success of the 2022 election and to the fact that we didn't see as much strife or we're not seeing as much strife, we're still immediate post-election 2022 than, than we did in 2020. Natalie? For me, what gives me hope is that we are just getting better and better and better at our job. Uh, and in some cases, the, um, our greatest skeptics are bringing things to light that we had not thought about before. And so we're able to respond to it and you know, sort of address some of the concerns that, that people have. Uh, I'm also heartened that there are advocates like you all and you know other election officials who still care, <laughs> who still feel like you have skin in the game and who recognize that sometimes being the target of somebody's um, um, dissatisfaction with elections can be really isolating. Uh, even though you know that there are other people going through it, sometimes it feels so lonely to be there. And that, you know, at least for this election, it feels like the temperature has been turned down quite a bit. And my own personal theory about that, because, you know, I, I, I had this you know, very public experience with, with my election, a lot of it was rooted in um, dissatisfaction with government around COVID policies. And now we don't have mask mandates. We, uh, probably don't have publications like the COVID Times, look it up. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it really feels like it took the wind out of some of the sails for, for some people for whom that was their issue. Uh, I don't know what the next issue is going to be moving forward, but I feel more prepared than ever to face it. Well, we're hoping to also take your questions. And um, I may also glance at my phone rudely from time to time. We're going to be getting some questions from cyberspace, I think. So. Uh, yes, thank you all so much. Uh, my name is Will Soltero. I'm the press secretary for Voting Rights Lab. Um, my question, I think it was raised earlier, the weaponization of um, frivolous uh, records requests and um, even uh, frivolous recounts for races that are far, uh, where the margin is extreme and cannot be overturned. Um, I wonder to each of you if um, there's any recourse to that, if it's legislatively, if it's administratively, if otherwise, because obviously there's tremendous importance to the availability of that sort of information, um, but it's hard to see sustainability in the, in the way that some of those requests are being made today. Thank you. Who wants to take that? I, I can start if you'd like. So in regards to the recount provision, that could be a legislative fix. I think when things like this come up, we can take a look at what solutions there might be, talk to our state legislators, talk to the governor's office, see what we can do collaboratively to make changes to our state law to help insulate local election officials from having to deal with that. Um, in Philadelphia, we're very lucky because while we're in the eye of the storm, being the most populous county in the largest swing state, we have the resources at the local level and assistance from other departments in the city. So for example, when a lot of my colleagues are dealing with you know, a mountain of open records requests, we have a pretty large solicitor's office that can assist us with that so that we can continue to focus on running elections. And the smaller counties or the less populous counties don't necessarily have that level of support. So it's about looking at the size of the jurisdictions and how we can help each jurisdiction differently, but depending on what their needs are. 
I want that. I, you know, I, I want a team that just, that is all they do. And they, pro you know, we, uh, this year we were really fortunate in my office. We had, you know, we have a, you know, relatively small staff and we have one general counsel and one paralegal in my office. And for most of this year, we had this fantastic paralegal who, you know, it, just having that one person who was dedicated, but you know, that also creates burnout, right? When, when we're dealing with not the normal level, I mean, any, any government office should expect and anticipate public records requests and we should be responsive to them. There, that, that is not the question that we're talking about here. We are talking about this coordinated weaponized effort to make it so hard for us to fulfill those requests that either we can't do our, the rest of our job properly or we can't fulfill the record request properly, right? And that's that's intentional. Um, that is a tactic, and it is intended to keep us from being able to do our jobs properly. Um, so I I think you know it, this really is it's a resource question um, because at the end of the day, like many states, we're looking at how we can better craft our public records laws. For example, one thing we want to make sure in my state that we are, aren't doing is giving away the keys to the castle. Right, what is, a, what is a public record that anybody should be able to just take a look at uh, whenever they want? And what is something that is, you know, what we need to keep internal so that we can keep hackers from getting into our system, right? So we are taking a look at that, and I think those are conversations that are happening and legislatures throughout the country. But, you know, again, I, I, you know, I don't want to be a broken record, um, but, you know, as Ben said, it's resources, resources, resources. We do want to be able to give out this information, but we, we need to make it so we can all have a, an office that functions like Seth's where they can focus on the work, we can focus on the work, and not on fulfilling records requests. I agree with everything that has been said about this. The only thing I would add uh, from my own experience, because somebody did request a, a recount of my contest, uh, I was 45 points ahead of second place. Uh, and <laughs> the point uh, the requester admitted on the news was really not to overturn the election result, but to get access to records that they would not have otherwise had access to through the normal Public Records Act process. Um, and when they saw the price tag of what a recount would cost and learned that they would not get their money back unless the result was overturned, they withdrew. And I'd just wrap up. Uh, I mean, absolutely. I'm not going to repeat all of this because they were great points, but, but I do think, uh, you know, as, as state legislatures look at their policy, I mean, we've seen, you know, this is, this is new. We've seen an erosion in norms, uh, you know, to, to Secretary Toulouse Oliver's point, you know, elections, you know, absolutely must be transparent. And, and so it's not that, but it's striking that balance between transparency and not allowing uh, for abuse. Uh, and whether that's um, you know, that's an amazing example, or, or or you know, I mean, I've certainly heard from offices, uh, you know, who have had to spend time speaking with constituents uh, because constituents were told to make a records request uh, by somebody online, and it's for something that that doesn't exist in that jurisdiction, or they don't even know what they're asking for because they're just forwarding essentially, uh, you know, a mass mailer. Uh, but the time that is involved with responding to that, again, you have to respond to that. That's the law. And so that becomes a resource challenge. More questions? Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, thanks so much. I um, grew up in rural San Juan County, New Mexico. I'm very proud of my state. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, my question, uh, I'm Lorelai Kelly. I run a program called GEODES, Georgetown Democracy Education and Service. Um, a lot of it is strengthening uh, institutions in the House and Senate. Um, when I was home in New Mexico for the pandemic, where I was taking care of a parent on a farm, um, I noticed that uh, the, the people don't really understand what counties do in general, and having lived in a city, um, and I feel like there's probably a really interesting public education campaign to be done that lets people know about sort of the critical infrastructure of your life that happens at the county level. I mean, there's what, dogs, dumps, democracy, <laughs> driving, and documents. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. 
uh, and I noticed when I came back to the city that people don't even understand there's 3,000 something counties and that there might be a way, if you're not a total process nerd and listening to how elections happen, simply to educate the public about how vital counties are. Um, and that if you had sort of an unlimited pro bono request to the best communications firms or social media influencers, um, what do you think that would look like for a whole of nation effort? And I, I would add, I worked at, in Congress and at the World Bank on terrorism issues and violent extremism. Um, and some of the most interesting case studies of countries was these whole of nation efforts where you had everything from the entertainment industry to school teachers talking about how we all go forward together. Um, do you, have anybody thought about that? Or that seems like something that's perfect between now and 2024. Um, I'll, I'll jump in there just to quickly say, uh, I mean, if we were gonna have a, a civics uh, education uh, conversation, I mean, one that's more than a whole uh, whole conference to itself. I mean, I do think this is a huge deal. Uh, I do think that, uh, you know, again, I, I'll, I'll speak for myself here. Uh, you know, that is that is a tough nut to crack. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think it starts with, with certainly, you know, more civics education in schools. Uh, I think it's people understanding, to your point, you know, where these services come from. Uh, and I would certainly love to see more of it. I mean, I think, I think it is critical, but uh, it is, that's a big challenge. And again, another huge resource investment. And I think the challenge with a whole of nation effort like that, and everyone here knows, elections are run predominantly at the county level, sometimes at the state level. Every jurisdiction is so unique in how they administer their elections, even within the same state that you'd have to be really nuanced and careful in how you're communicating that to the voters so that you're not accidentally misinforming them on what happens where they live. So resourcing it or providing guidelines at a national level could be extremely helpful, um, but then we have to dig down really to the county level to get that communication effort across. And as a commissioner, you know, we go around the city everywhere. I mean, I'm at as many civic associations, events as I can be at, talking to voters at jazz nights and at their community centers, just to make sure that they're informed about what to expect when they go vote. And it takes a lot of manpower and a lot of long nights and a lot of missed bedtimes for the kids to be able to do that. So there has to be a way, as you suggested, to try and resource that and, and make it a broader approach, but you have to do it carefully. Natalie, you must have some thoughts on this. I'd love a county <laughs> official's perspective on it. Well, you know, I have joked a lot about how, you know, I think that, you know, our stories need to kind of go mainstream a little bit, like a Parks and Rec type uh, <laughs> sitcom. <laughs> and, I mean, it, it, it is a joke, but I'm kind of serious, too, because, you know, with all the serious talk that we have about elections, you don't really get all of the goofiness that happens in our offices. <laughs> Sometimes the you know stuff that you wouldn't believe um, goes on behind the scenes, like the guy who you know hasn't heard about how his election results ended up. He was a candidate because he was in jail for biting somebody. Um, you know, right? You know, you just don't get uh, all of that when um, you know you are on panels like this. Um, you know, it might be nice to have a little bit of a bird's eye view, not because we should use sitcoms to, to educate people, but um, you know, the, there's just something about elections that are only cool to geeks like us, <laughs> right? I want them to be cool to everyone. I want people to be like, oh yeah, that, that's how you do vote by mail. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where you start, you know? I love being yeah, in the club. <laughs> Maggie, did you want to add anything? I, I mean, I will just add, I, I, I agree with the point of, of all of the levels of government in this country. I think county government is sort of the most um, obscure to folks. And I would like to start with my just my commissioners understanding what their job is. I don't think they want me coming to their county <laughs> telling them how to do dogs, dumps, and driving. Um, likewise, I, you know, I don't want them making election policy because that's not their job. But I, but I, you know, all humor aside or sassiness aside, really, um, <laughs> you know, when I, you know, I was at the county level for 10 years and, and I knew, you know, there's all this incredible 
important stuff going on, and we would have maybe three people. You know, you know how does the regulars that show up to testify about whatever their pet issue is before every commission hearing. But man, if we had an animal control ordinance on the agenda, that room would be full, right? But that's about it. And so I think um, just demystifying local government is important. One thing I think was good about COVID, many bad things, <laughs> is that I think that was part of the reason we did have such great turnout in 2020, because people really started to realize the impact that state and local government had on their daily lives. And so whatever we can do to, to continue to sort of expand that understanding is a plus. Do we, I, I know we're committing the sin of, of running into lunch here. Do, oh can we gosh. take a couple more minutes for <laughs> questions before we wrap this up or? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'll keep it very quick. Um, my name is Roberta Braga. I'm director of counter disinformation strategies at Equis and we work directly with Latino voters in the US. Um, I previously worked on Latin America. So my question is, um, we've talked a lot about the importance of sort of pre-bunking about the elections process, informing, explaining proactively. And I wondered if you could share a little bit more, given that we have New Mexico and Nevada represented today, about any efforts from your offices this past year um, in doing so in non-English languages for those constituents and what opportunities you see in the future. I know there are a lot of issues with resources, um, but are there partnerships that you could foresee or other opportunities where organizations like ours, for example, could lend a hand with that? Um, so. I'll just start by saying, so first of all, I'm, I'm intensely aware of the challenges of mis- and disinformation, particularly in Spanish language and in, in, in and among the Latino communities in the state, in the country. Um, you know, New Mexico is, is rare because uh, our Spanish-speaking folks have been in the state for hundreds of years. Um, and everything that we do in elections in New Mexico is done in both English and Spanish by a constitutional mandate. Um, I am one of the only election officials in the state that speaks Spanish. I routinely do interviews on Spanish language uh, TV and radio, but there's always more that we need to be doing uh, in terms of translating all of our social media. Um, we, we've added, uh, I think, effective translation to our website, but there, there needs to be more, I think, direct outreach. And so I will just say, yes, I'd love to talk to you about how we can work together to do a better job. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you so much for the question. This is something actually that um, is really important to me personally. Uh, Philadelphia, for the first time after the census, uh, we added a new language for our Section 203 requirements. So for decades, Philadelphia had to do everything in English and Spanish, um, and we now added Chinese to our repertoire of languages that we were required to uh, provide resources in by federal law. But we wanted to go even beyond that. So we actually uh, proposed and passed a policy um, at the commissioner's board meeting where we expanded to an additional six languages for a lot of our resources from Russian and Vietnamese to Khmer, uh, Portuguese, Arabic. I mean, we really wanted to take seriously reaching out to as many voters as possible in Philadelphia to make sure that they were informed about the elections and protected from mis- and disinformation in languages other than English. So it's really important that we do everything in our power to reach as many voters as possible, and language access is one way we can do that. Uh, so at the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, uh, one of the you know challenges of doing uh, anything at the national level or 50 state level is that each each uh, state uh, runs elections in its own unique way. Uh, and to me, this is one of those areas uh, that we've been able to do a lot of work on recently that I've been really proud of. Uh, you know, accessibility broadly uh, is a 50 state issue. Uh, language accessibility is a 50 state issue. Uh, and so we've produced uh, a number of resources to help election officials. Uh, I think that's a big deal we've made. Uh, the federal uh, voter registration application uh, available in more languages than it's ever been. Uh, I think that's great as well. And, and more broadly, I think uh, an important piece of your question is that, uh, and to tie into the one earlier, uh, to me, combating mis- and disinformation is sort of a two-sided coin. One side of that is, is uh, fact-checking uh, and getting accurate information out there, and one side of that is voter education. And I think too often, um, you know, again, when we're facing uh, the broader resource challenges that we see, 
uh, and election offices are deciding, you know, what they can and can't afford to do. Uh, you know, you, they have to look at their statutory mandates and fill those first. And too often, voter education, that comes at the cost of voter education. And so when we're talking about resourcing, uh, I think that's a huge piece of that. And then to be able to meet uh, voters where they are uh, in their communities, in their languages, is, is a critical piece of that. For me, because I come from a jurisdiction that's fairly small, I depend on others to bring resources to me and the um, sort of main conduit of um, um, communications in other languages is from the Secretary of State's office and they do have these prepackaged uh, election toolkits uh, that we can use. I mean, I, do, I will say that my county is probably one of the uh, least diverse in California. Um, so, you know, there, there is not a, a sort of a huge demand for, for um, other languages, but, the, you know, there's also, um, you know, sort of a stigma for, for people who do um, sort of prefer election materials in other languages. So we do want to, um, you know, sort of address that. But, you know, up until this point, we hadn't even had a person who was sort of dedicated to social media to see what people were talking about. I mean, it's scary when I'm the person who has the most communications experience, <laughs> and it's only because I have, like, the social media accounts um, you know, I, I definitely could use, you know, a little bit of those sweet EAC funds to do some <laughs> more communications, um, but yeah, it's, it's a process. All right, well, I, you know, as much as I hate to be in the position of, of cutting off questions instead of just keeping them going continuously, um, I think I'm going to get the hook if I don't let you all go have lunch. So I'm supposed to tell everyone to go down to the third floor, but I first just want to thank all of our panelists for being here, for having this wonderful conversation with me, um, and for being so gracious about it and, and sharing all they know. So thank you very much. One more thing on the, uh, the lunch. So we have a really exciting lunch planned. We have about an hour to an hour and a half till 1.30. It's sponsored by the MIT Election Data Science Lab. After the academics get a chance to eat, we're gonna have 15 stationed around the lunchroom on the third floor presenting their research. Um, they have big posters down there, so please go around, ask them questions. These are like the you know new fresh off the press research from this year about the election, so please go talk to them. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Be back here at 1.30 for the next panel. <laughs>